to this webinar. Thanks everybody for joining us. Um, my name is David Wiener. As, as Michelle said, I'm the um, owner executive director of uh, OMH Solutions. Um, a little bit about um, myself and the company. Um, so I'm a, an LCSW. It's a licensed clinical social worker. Uh, I have about 13 years of working in um, public health, uh, doing assessments um, in community health, schools, hospitals, private companies. Um, and over the past few years, we've uh, kind of taken these um, these evidence-based assessments and, and re really have started to apply them to uh, the workforce itself. Um, in this lovely photo, you can see uh, my um, wife and co-owner of OMH Solutions, Nikki, holding uh, this adorable baby. Um, and uh, her specialty is in um, ergonomic assessment. She has a doctorate in occupational therapy uh, and environmental um, modifications. Um, so getting started on our uh, actual presentation here, just to review what we'll be talking about uh, for the next bit. Um, we'll be defining the current state of um, employee wellness programs. Uh, these are employee wellness programs, as most people know them in the traditional sense. Um, we'll identify some common workforce uh, wellness trends and effective initiatives to, uh, to uh, address these trends. Uh, and we'll review methods um, for developing effective workforce uh, wellness initiatives for um, your company, whether uh, no, no matter the size of the employees uh, for that company. Um, and we'll also discuss the benefits of, of having these workforce wellness initiatives um, in place for your organization. And uh, just uh, again on the agenda, we, we will be doing some um, juxtaposing uh, for what what's known as is more traditional wellness programs versus uh, some of these next generation of um, of workforce well-being initiatives that that my company has has been seeing uh, kind of develop over the last um, over the last couple years here. And so the uh, current state of um, wellness programs and and these are these traditional wellness programs. Uh, these which include employee sponsored um, activities that, that could involve uh, exercise programs, weight loss competitions, uh, educational seminars meant to increase um, physical health through lifestyle changes. Sometimes they have tobacco cessation programs. They very often involve health screenings uh, and they're, they're kind of designed to help employees um, improve their physical health uh, whether it's through exercise, nutrition, um, and sometimes they also include uh, stress management as well. We've seen a, a real significant increase um, in the prevalence of these programs over the past uh, decade especially, and, and here are just some numbers to really understand what, what this increase has looked like. So 50% of organizations with 50 or more employees actually have an employee uh, wellness program and some of you listening in might, might be familiar with these programs just from um, your own employers having them. Uh, medium to large employers spend an average of $521 per an employee annually on wellness programs. So these are becoming um, a large item with, within the budget uh, annually for organizations. 71% uh, of all firms think wellness programs are very or somewhat effective. And the industry itself, the wellness program industry, um, has grown into quite a large one, a, a six of um, six billion dollars. So, uh, obviously, as as participation has increased, so has the dollar amount that is spent um, on this industry. And so, um, you know, this webinar is called "Raising the Bar on Employee Well-Being," so it's important to establish where uh, the bar is now. Um, there are uh, three kind of major components that are really the foundation of, of these uh, traditional employee wellness programs. And these are health risk assessments, biometric health screens, 
and uh, incentive programs. Um, and just to, to, you might be familiar with these, but I'll review these briefly. So a health risk assessment is a questionnaire that collects um, employee personal health information uh, to inform them on possible lifestyle changes. So this, some questions might ask, do you smoke? How many times a week do you exercise? How much do you sleep each night? Um, even do you wear your, your seatbelt? It's really tried to identify high-risk behavior with, within that individual's life um, to match uh, program services with, with these um, high-risk behaviors. Uh, biometric health screens are, are really just medical tests, medical screenings. These often involve actually uh, taking blood samples, measuring things like cholesterol and um, blood pressure, blood glucose, blood sugar levels, um, again, to inform participation in certain aspects um, of, the, of the program. They also might take body mass, body mass index, uh, BMI, and maybe even look at aerobic fitness itself. Uh, and the, uh, a real hallmark of these programs are, are incentives. And these incentives can range from a point system where um, if, if you participate in a employer-sponsored exercise activity or if you get so many steps in each month through a pedometer program, then uh, you get 50 points. And if you get 50 points a month, then you get like a $25 gift card to uh, Applebee's or whatever your favorite um, establishment is. Uh, incentives can, can not only be participate, can not only be um, involved in the actual activities, but they can actually incentivize participation in the program itself through health insurance premiums. And what this looks like is where uh, my employer's uh, kind of baseline health insurance premium might, might be $200 a month for me. And what they would say is, well, if you participate in this program by just taking the health risk assessment and doing the biometric health screen, will knock $50 off that health insurance premium a month and uh, you know, knock it down to $150. So they can actually incentivize the programs by having a premium reduction um, regardless of whether or not the, the, it, it, the program participation is, is effective on improving your health. And so uh, I brought up the word effective, and, and kind of this is uh, the, the big question here. So are they effective? I mean, we, we've seen a um, huge increase in the prevalence of these programs over the past decade, especially. You're talking about a $6 billion industry. This is not marginal. Um, large employers spend $500 a year on, on their employees. Uh, again, this is a pretty big line item within um, an organization's budget. Uh, so it, it definitely begs the question, um, is it making a um, measurable effect? Is it actually improving employee health by having these programs? Uh, and, and so surprisingly, um, there is not a large amount of reliable data or, or research that's um, out there that establishes the benefits of, of these programs. Um, and the the ones that are out there, so there is a, a study by the Rand Corporation um, that followed Pepsi, PepsiCo's employee wellness program, which is a traditional employee wellness program, as, as I, as I kind of defined earlier, uh, and this was a long-term seven-year study. And these are important because, as we all know, we don't, uh, we don't change overnight. We don't get this idea of healthier overnight. And so are these programs actually making an impact? And what this study found is, is that um, there was a big difference between programs that, and services that targeted specific diseases, such as employees with medical, medical conditions like asthma, uh, coronary heart disease, um, diabetes, uh, chronic back pain, COPD, uh, versus components of the program that focused more on lifestyle changes, which is like smoking cessation and improving fitness and nutrition and weight. And, and what this study found is that basically the, the real uh, value comes in when you're able to target specific medical conditions that employees are willing to let you work with 
um, like like heart disease uh, or somebody that's had a stroke or diabetes versus lifestyle changes. So there is very little evidence to show that traditional employee wellness programs um, that that support these kind of lifestyle management changes are actually having an effect on improving um, employee health. Um, some of the other other things that that we see with with uh, efficacy regarding these programs are that they tend to incentivize ongoing healthy behavior. And what this really says is that uh, you know I like to play racquetball um, when whenever I'm available to do so, and uh, I might be involved in a employee wellness program that gives me points for this aerobic activity. Well, you know I'm not doing this aerobic activity more because they're, they're giving me points or incentivizing it. I am just going to use my existing aerobic activity to, to get my, my gift card to Applebee's. Um, so it's this idea where they're not, I'm not really changing my lifestyle because of this program. I'm just adapting the program to match these activities that I'm already doing. Um, again, kind of a, a minimal short-term healthcare cost decrease. And in fact, what they often see is the opposite because of these biometric screenings um, encouraging people to go give blood uh, for their employer and get these tests done, what they often see is actually an overutilization of health systems. Um, and sometimes it even leads to unnecessary tests being done. I mean, as you know, if, if you've ever had to uh, had an emergency condition or even kind of an urgent condition, um, sometimes there's a bit of a domino effect where you go in uh, they might give you an EKG in an emergency department. All of a sudden, you're you're getting a uh, echocardiogram, an ultrasound, a CAT scan, and so one thing that can be minimally invasive can kind of build to almost an overutilization of health systems. And the final thing to think about this regarding efficacy, and and what well, we're going to move on to this too, is it shifts costs to people that are labeled unhealthy workers, and all this means is that these individuals are choosing not to um, participate in the uh, health program itself. So uh, again, like if 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 uh, Joe participates in the employee wellness program, he sees a premium reduction of fifty dollars a month. Um, John chooses not to for whatever reasons, not necessarily because he's unhealthy. Maybe he has four young children, he's busy as it is, and he knows that it's not realistic to take time um, to go to the doctor to get these labs done, or maybe he just doesn't want to get the labs done because it's personal health information, so he ends up paying more, and it's it's a good way for employers to um, have a certain portion of their workforce uh, take on the majority of the burden for increased health insurance premiums. And so kind of moving on, uh, you know, what does this look like for the employee experience regarding these programs? Because um, this is really what it's all about. Like if, if you're talking about improving an employee's lifestyle, uh, you would think that, that the way that employees actually experience these programs would, would be forefront um, in, in administrating them. Uh, and, you know, I, I say do no harm here because that's kind of a common uh, mantra in the medical field. Uh, you're not to you know do no harm, um, and uh, sometimes uh, and you know unwittingly just because of how pervasive the programs are, um, large employers especially are participating in these programs, and sometimes they might be doing uh, more harm than good um, by by uh, incentivizing employees to encourage these. And some of the ways that you can look at this is. Not many of them are, are integrated. These employee wellness programs often function outside of the workplace itself. So they might incentivize you doing physical activity, um, you know, at, at home or at the gym, um, or uh, you know, doing things to, to decrease your your blood pressure or your blood sugar. But as far as is the way that these are integrated to the actual workplace experience itself, um, can be minimal. And, and there is some irony in this. It's kind of the elephant in the room where you look at, um, if you're talking about improving people's lifestyles, uh, when, when people, uh, working adults, spend um, almost a third of their waking uh, hours, a, a third of, of 
their working life at, at work, um, how can this not be part of the lifestyle? So what we find is that many of these programs don't actually address the work experience itself, which could have a huge impact um, in this idea of, of a healthy lifestyle. What we also see is unbalanced programs, and, and this is kind of the, the hallmark with a lot of these programs. And some of them have gotten better uh, for addressing stress and emotional health, but often these programs are, are much more weighted on um, – on physical health, on nutrition, on losing weight, uh, on on things like smoking, than they are on 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 really kind of the comprehensive experience of of the individual. Um, and what what happens here is it's it's really just like taking an aspirin uh, for a, a migraine or for a terrible headache. You you might be treating the symptoms. Um, you know, and even by getting somebody to smoke, you might be getting getting them to smoke by stopping by having them stop smoking. You you might see a uh, health improvement there. But the real question is, you know, they could be smoking because they are extremely stressed out in one area of their life. Um, same thing with eating. I mean, a lot of these things are symptomatic of of coping skills that people use uh, to deal with the real issue. So um, an, another piece here is is this invasive procedures. Uh, again, you know, I, I'm sure we all love going to the doctor and having them stick needles in our arms, um, especially when our boss is is giving us money to go do this. Uh, and it's funny, you know, that this kind of seems like a common sense thing where there would be, um, you know, just this idea where where it's it's kind of not our employer's place to have us um, focus on this. So a, a lot of times, these procedures themselves can be very invasive. Um, especially for people with chronic medical conditions. I mean, you know, if if, if I have an issue um, like multiple sclerosis or, or Crohn's disease or asthma, and I fill out the health risk assessment and get my biometric uh, data completed, um, and I score poorly by saying that there's some type of lifestyle adjustment I can make to improve these values, is um, it's it's erroneous and and con kind of condescending. Uh, and that can lead to adverse engagement, um, which in, in such a competitive uh, culture now for good talent, um, no company wants. Uh, you know, and, and a good example of that is you can have somebody who's, who's a great performer, who is a great team worker, and let's say he has a high body mass index. Um, well, that might not have any impact on him being uh, a, a great a great employee and doing a great job for you. And all of a sudden, if, if you decide to make it a, an issue as his employer, um, chances are he might become less uh, engaged with the work and, and it could have an adverse effect. And uh, we also see that they're collecting a lot of sensitive health information, which um, not only makes the uh, employee feel vulnerable, but it could also open up the work place itself, uh, the employer, to um, some compliance issues uh, with the sensitive information. And there are um, multiple laws, um, including the Americans with Disabilities Act, Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, the Affordable Care Act, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA, to uh, make sure that employers can't use health information um, in a way that would somehow discriminate not only on hiring but but promoting um, firing what on any component of, of kind of that uh, that job spectrum they, they can't use this information to discriminate so if if the employer itself is is amassing large amounts of employee, Health information and data, um, you can see how that could possibly open them up to some some liability. Uh, and obviously, if if this corresponds maybe with a corrective action of, on an employee, and they just happen to um, get their biometric data done, and and they they had some poor results, um, you know, it it might give an employee um, some empowerment to to possibly um, look at look at some type of action against their employer. Uh, and now the EEOC did establish some guidelines on how these uh, more traditional employee wellness programs um, need to be designed. Uh, so 
One is programs must be reasonably designed to promote health or prevent disease. Um, participation in these programs uh, must be voluntary, cannot be mandatory. Um, they cannot deny coverage under any group health plan for non-participation. So basically you can't pick and choose um, who you're going to provide coverage to based on the outcome of their biometric screening or their health risk assessment. Um, they, your employer must also disclose how they're going to use this information. So there should always be some type of disclosure article uh, any time an employer asks you to provide um, this, this sensitive health information, they need to be very transparent on, on how they're going to use it. Um, and they came up with this number, uh, the EOC did, that, that program incentives cannot exceed 30% of the total cost of self-only co coverage. And this last bullet point um, is supposed to support the second bullet, bullet point where participation is supposed to be voluntary. Um, where, you know, they, they can't make the incentives so cost prohibitive that employees don't have a choice as to basically it forces them to participate in the programs because if they didn't, they'd be going broke. And, it, and it's interesting. So at the, um, these came out at the end of 2016 and at the, I, I think it was just in August of this year, a federal court struck down this last, um, uh, bullet point here, this idea of the 30% total cost of self-only coverage, and they found that this was just kind of an arbitrary number that the EEOC came up with, and it really wasn't founded in any type of um, any type of research that that to really establish when a program, when these incentives stop making a program seem voluntary, and when they begin to make a program seem kind of mandatory, because they do become cost prohibitive. So the EEOC is actually in the process of, of redefining this um, last bullet point here. Okay, so now that, that I've kind of talked about the current state of wellness programs, um, and as you can hear, I, I, just from my experience with them um, and the work that I do with employers um, and from evaluating them, I, I'd, I'd lie if I'd say I'm, I'm a little bit biased um, uh, you know, it, it, in my feelings towards some of these programs. And, uh, you know, what, what all this raises is, is really where should we be focusing um, as employers? You know, and, and again, this is whether we're talking about a small business uh, with, with three or four employees or whether we're the CEO of, of Coca-Cola with um, tens of thousands of employees. Um, and so bear with me for a moment. So words, words are important, as we all know, and... Um, there's the, these words employee wellness programs have become um, so uh, pervasive that, that I feel like sometimes we kind of lose meaning in, in the terms themselves. So just to offer some definitions, uh, you know, an employee is a, obviously an individual that's employed for us for wages or salaries. Um, whereas a workforce are workers engaged in a specific activity or enterprise. I mean, employees equal the individual, workforce really equals the team. Uh, when we talk about wellness, we're talking about the state of being in good health. When we're talking about well-being, we're talking about the state of being uh, comfortable, happy, or healthy. It's, it's a much more three-dimensional uh, kind of definition here when we talk about well-being versus wellness, um, which is is kind of more black and white. You're either, you're either well or you're not. You could be well-being uh, addresses different components of, of somebody's overall health, happiness, and, and even uh, whether or not they're comfortable. Um, and I kind of like this. So programs are a planned series of future events uh, where initiatives are acts or strategies intended to resolve a difficulty or improve a situation. And the big difference here, and this is kind of the the hallmark of a lot of these employee wellness programs is that the programs are already there. Okay. So, so there's a, a pedometer program, there's an exercise program, there's yoga, there's, um, you know, a masseuse that comes by and then you fill out the health risk assessment and you get to pick which program best matches your unhealthy behavior to improve that. Whereas an initiative is informed first and foremost by the evaluation itself. It's informed 
uh, and then developed based on um, the evaluation versus uh, a program that that somebody in leadership thinks is a great idea that um, that, that then gets to kind of uh, be matched with an employee health issue after the fact. And and really, what what we're talking about here, employee wellness programs. Um, uh, versus workforce well-being initiatives. So employee wellness programs look at the individual, their lifestyle, they kind of put them and, and their identified health issues in the spotlight. Um, where an employee, where a workforce well-being initiative is really looking at the um, whole workforce, um, identifying trends within that workforce experience, uh, the workplace experience itself, and then coming up with initiatives that are integrated into the experience to to address it, versus um, programs which employee wellness programs, uh, which offer services that are often um, kind of independent, even kind of intentionally outside of um, the work itself, because you know, God forbid, if if a wellness service kind of interfered with with employees getting getting the work done. When really they they should actually complement the work that's being done, and so we'll talk a little bit here about um, developing effective work workforce well-being initiatives, um, and this isn't uh, reinventing the wheel here. I mean, uh, a lot of this is very similar to like the scientific method. Um, what you're what you're doing here when you're uh, developing an effective initiative is you're always starting with a with an evaluation. You want to evaluate. Um, the workforce and the workplace experience. You want to use this evaluation to begin to identify certain trends, and we'll get into some of these areas and, and some of the trends that we see. Um, and then even once you've identified the trends, uh, you want to make sure that you know the source that, that these trends are coming from. So you can identify a common trend is, is that um, uh, you know, the workforce is regularly feeling overwhelmed, that your team is regularly feeling overwhelmed, that there's a lot of stress. Well, that's great, but if you're going to identify that stress, you really have to clarify the source of it. And that's where um, that's where, where this is so important. Um, and then planning initiatives, uh, not only around these trends and, and some of the sources of the trends, but also valuing employee feedback when you're planning the initiatives. Uh, so often with programs that sound good, such as, as yoga or bringing masseuses in, you know, it, they, they sound very kind of forward thinking and, and um, appealing when, you're, when you send out all staff emails to participate in these, but when a very small percentage of your staff actually participates, that's a problem. I mean, obviously for multiple reasons. Uh, so before any real service or program is going to be implemented, it's very important to survey staff on some level to see if there's going to be a particip to gauge the likelihood of participation and even get their ideas for what those those programs would look like. Um, then you implement your initiatives and you always want to uh, reevaluate. Um, that initiative uh, within six to 12 months of, of implementation. Um, and this can also be something that's, that's an ongoing process as far as if there's like an immediate issue that arises. And so some evaluation methods are, um, you know, a, a lot of companies of, of any size can begin to do this internally and, and even independently um, at kind of very little cost. Uh, so existing data and, and what we're talking about here is personnel data uh, that organizations keep on absenteeism, critical incidents, corrective actions. I mean, if, if, if you're able to see trends in this information, um, this can really be used in a powerful way uh, to, to try to go in and proactively address some of these situations based on that existing personnel data. Um, observation is, is also a, a good one. It's funny, they say that actions speak louder than words. And sometimes looking at a, at a busy workplace or busy work environment and just taking a time to kind of uh, check in, look around at your staff, it's very clear if somebody's can be stressed out, if there's regular coworker conflicts, um, even looking at the environment itself. Uh, you know, I, I kind of use the analogy regularly. 
um, does this work environment look at a place look like a place that um, is is comfortable? I mean, often there's a large discrepancy between somebody's work environment and between their home environment. Generally, their home environment is a place that they choose to modify the the, the surroundings uh, to adjust it to their own personal comfort where work environments can sometimes be especially stark and devoid of that, but they can still have that same effect um, on our feelings of comfort and engagement with the work itself. Um, we can also do uh, assessments. Um, this can be done either internally, and there's a lot of great resources out there, checklists um, that, can, that can be done, um, or you can bring in an, an organization um, similar to, to mine, OMH Solutions, that, that does customized uh, assessments to really target some of these issues. Uh, and I put focus groups on there, and it's very important to never to neglect a qualitative discussion with your team when, de when developing workforce well-being initiatives. These can only complement uh, the quantitative information that we get from our assessments, from our um, personnel data, and the existing data that uh, that we might have. And so these are some common areas of um, workforce uh, well-being that 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 we see that we evaluate for. Um, and and this is idea of taking a comprehensive approach. Uh, so when we look at work-life balance, this is this is time for family, friends. Um, recreational activities that 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 your workers have, um, and you think about it. You know, when when we work with uh, with employers, we we prioritize these areas for their workforce, and this one consistently comes on top. Um, and and it's not a surprise. I mean, generally, folks work even if they love their job. It it's it's kind of secondary to the. Um, Work that uh, they've that they've um, that they're that they're doing uh, with the family, doing the recreational activities with the hobbies themselves. Um, obviously, emotional health in the workplace is important. We're not only talking about stress; we're also talking about um, feelings of reward uh, and accomplishment. Making sure that there is that there. Uh, Environmental design, with, the, with this we talk about ergonomics, um, acoustic design, sound paneling, uh, lighting, um, visual design, workplace social health is, is a huge one. Um, there's multiple studies out there that, that show that just by having uh, a friend on your team increases engagement, retention, performance. Uh, folks find that it, it's, it's kind of similar to the military you find that you're not only working uh, for the for the objective um, for the job itself, but you start to actually work for your for your coworkers, for your friends. There's organizational policies that have a big effect on um, things like like absenteeism, uh, sick leave, things that that could encourage presenteeism, um, and of course workplace physical health, which uh, could involve um, more sedentary jobs, looking at workplace injuries, um, and accessibility to, to good food at work, too. And so here are some um, effective initiatives that, that we've seen. And again, I, I put in parentheses, they're always informed, because in fact, effective initiatives are always informed. Um, you know, uh, leadership should never just kind of wake up, you know, sit, sit around on their break and be like, oh, I think it'd be a great idea uh, to put a bunch of stand-up desks in my work environment. Um, and this is something that we kind of see commonly where, where it's, uh, you know, they, they have some money to spend and they might spend $10,000 on some um, great, great ergonomic equipment. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's not really indicated for the employees. That type of equipment isn't indicated for the employees that are working with it, um, and they don't utilize it. So it's just important that they're always, always informed uh, same thing with like stress management. It's important to bring somebody in and, and to coach folks on how to effectively deal with stress is great. It should always be done within the context of whatever it is that is likely causing them that stress. Um, that's how it's going to be most useful. Uh, sound paneling, acoustic design is extremely important. Um, they see, uh, 
you know, the, these statistics are just kind of um, really impressive when it comes to increasing productivity by up to 38%, reducing stress by up to 27%, increasing job satisfaction by up to 174% by just having an effective acoustic design in some of these open office spaces um, is important in itself. Financial coaching, um, you know, folks don't feel like they have a handle on their personal finances. It becomes very difficult for them to, um, to, to, to do an effective job at work. Uh, and then anything like workforce re retreats or, or even just, just having um, utilizing common areas, break rooms, um, doing informal work lunches or dinners, uh, anything that fosters that, that sense of social co cohesiveness among your team is, is very important. Um, and here are some established benefits, uh, retention, performance, and engagement. I mean, if, uh, if, if you develop these work, workforce wellness initiatives around um, effective evaluations and feedback from your employees, then right away they feel like they're being more valued and then they see these, thing, these things being realized in the workplace. And kind of most importantly, uh, leadership always thinks they have an idea of what it's like to be an employee for them, but they don't, you know? Um, the only real way they, they know is by, uh, by, by doing an informed um, assessment evaluation and, and really addressing it. And, you know, if you, if you have a good idea of what that workforce, uh, workplace experience is like for your employees, that's a real powerful thing for you as, as a leader. Um, so last month's uh, webinar that, that Drew Pollack did was talking about culture in the workplace. And, uh, you know, he, he cited um, some information by a psychologist named Frederick Hertzberg, who was one of the first to really define some of these qualities of workplace culture. And if you look at these things, work conditions, peer relationships, supervisor relationships, work-life balance, company policies, work itself, um, we're really talking about uh, th these should be synonymous with, with workforce well-being and the workplace experience. So culture and workplace well-being are uh, really kind of go hand in hand or they should. And what really boils down to the brand itself, all these things should be aligned. Um, and now it's more important than ever. I mean, I'm, I'm sure we can all think of a time that we've worked for a company that advertises one set of values to its clients or its customers, but it's a but there's a very different set of values when it comes to managing uh, the workforce internally itself. And with employer review sites like Glassdoor, there 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 really are no secrets about the workplace experience anymore. People can very easily and publicly to critique uh, discrepancies um, with the brand of your product and and the internal company culture. Uh, and what addressing um, workforce well-being initiatives can do is make sure that these are aligned. And, you know, with retaining and hiring good talent, um, a, a lot of these things uh, kind of speak for themselves. It, it's, it's really getting to this place where, we, where, we need, where we're starting to see um, our employers, uh, I'm sorry, our employees as, as customers really themselves. I mean, um, if, if they have a bad experience, it becomes viral just as if a, um, a customer has a bad experience in your organization with, with the way that social media is nowadays. Um, so to kind of sum things up a little bit here, uh, how many employees for a company uh, to have a workforce well-being initiative um, and the magic number is one. And I would even argue that it's, that it's, Kind of most important. I mean, if you're a, a single person startup, um, people really have a tendency to to sacrifice everything for their for their startup. And uh, this idea that that you're going to prioritize your your kind of burgeoning business over your personal health, over your family, over uh, the the things that you enjoy, um, I, I think that's going to be a flame that that, that burns out relatively quickly. So, um, you know, whether you're this uh, guy sitting on a couch um, on his Mac or a large office space like the one on the right, um, it's kind of imperative now more than ever to, to address, um, to have these workforce well-being initiatives. And I'll just kind of sum it up with this, that the average person uh, works for um, 90,000 hours in their life. 
and, and you know, whether we're talking about um, doing this for ourselves or leading a large company, um, it's, it's just this idea where, um, you know, wh why not try to make this workplace experience as, as, as effective and valuable and, and healthy as possible. Um, these are, before I open up for questions, I'll just give some good resources here. So the CDC is, has just some awesome resources for ways uh, to, to um, measure your own internal uh, workplace health. The Job Accommodation Network um, is great. So, so they're really focused around looking at modifications and enhancements for individuals with disabilities, but they have such a database that, that it, it really can apply to any type of workspace, um, really creative modifications. Steel case is, is kind of on the forefront of um, environmental design. They also do research on effective de environmental design to inform your own company. Uh, and then my company, OMH Solutions, this is our website here. We, uh, we, have, we publish regular blogs that, that give good tips. We have um, education modules on practices that, that you can do for yourself and with your employees to increase workforce well-being. Um, and I would, if, if you have, uh, if you have, if you want to start a conversation about um, ways to address some of these issues uh, for yourself or within your organization, I, this is my contact information here. And um, thank you, and then we'll open it up for questions. Fantastic, David. Thank you so much. Wonderful presentation. So we've had a couple questions come in. So first question is, what are examples of well-known organizations that are known for model wellness initiatives? Yeah, so that's a good question. And when we think about um, about these these more traditional programs, we think about Google uh, and large companies. And you know, I I think what I've learned through doing this is you don't have to have unlimited resources to um, to have effective programs. So if we're going to talk about large companies, uh, you know, one that comes to mind is SC Johnson Wax, um, which is a large established company over 100 years old, and they do a great job. I, I believe they have traditional employee wellness program going on, but they also integrate the workforce experience where they actually have coaches that are independent of their of, of the leadership team, of the supervisors that you can go to to look at how to make that workforce experience better. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, you know, we, we've worked with some really good small local companies, and, and Asheville is a great example of that, where um, you know, some of these outdoor companies and, and branding companies where they're, they're kind of um, talking the talk and walking the walk, and they've, they've done some, some things to improve the social cohesion and, and the workplace environment and work-life balance that, that are not cost prohibitive. Okay, great. Uh, next question is, are traditional wellness programs audited by an outside agency? Yes, yeah, so, um, you know, if, if we're talking about an audit as far as how effective they are, they, they absolutely can be. Um, we really encourage, uh, especially large employers with big traditional employee wellness programs, to, um, to conduct kind of regular internal audits because uh, number one, you want to make sure that if you're spending $500 per an employee on this program, that it's hitting the mark. Um, and that if you're keeping large employee personal health information, large amounts of this information, that you're doing it in a way uh, that doesn't break the law. Um, the Department of Labor, the EEOC um, can come in and, and kind of have a broad mandate uh, to do a more formal audit of of these traditional wellness programs. So, and and my company does does do some of these internal audit audit work. So, if if somebody's interested in um in talking about this, I'm I'm happy to to talk about it outside of this webinar. Great. Uh, last question is: How is compliance enforced in wellness programs? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, the, and I and I kind of brought that up a bit for at the last um, that last question. It's really the um, the Department of Labor uh, has a pretty broad capability to review not only group health insurance plans but actually the the wellness programs themselves. Um, and uh, you know, unless you're you're a really large employer like Walmart or Coca Cola. I, I don't believe that they're really doing the, these types of reviews too proactively, but the real issue comes into the back end where 
um, if if somebody feels like there's uh, potential discrimination going on through participation in this program, they can contact the EEOC and the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, uh, will will gladly sue on their behalf. Um, and all of a sudden, it becomes expensive, even if that um, even if that isn't an, un, an unsubstantiated uh, claim. Perfect. Well, it looks like we've covered all of the questions that have come in. Um, so thank you so much for presenting today. And David, if you could just scroll forward on the oh, last yeah. screen. Yep. Um, so for future, um, these are the upcoming webinar events that we have coming up. Um, Ready, Set, Grow is how to predict and manage employee growth. That's going to be given by myself. Um, Stopping Fraud Dead in Its Tracks will be given by Jessica Knox, who's the Vice President from PNC Bank. And Handling Conflict, What's Wrong With You, will be given by one of our partners, Jonathan Branch, um, in January. Um, so stay tuned. We're always adding stuff. I hope everybody has a great day. We will be uh, emailing out a copy of the presentation for everyone. And David, again, we thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you for, uh, thanks, thanks everybody for, for logging in today. Wonderful. All right, everyone, we're signing off. Thank you. Thanks.